This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them at the end of the video. The Hubble tension is a pretty embarrassing part of cosmology for those of us working in the field. So much so that it's also become known as the crisis in cosmology. It refers to the fact that when we try to measure the expansion rate of the universe, how fast the universe is expanding in size right now, there are two possible ways to do this. In theory, this should be great because the expansion rate is something that we want to know very precisely and it's very important for loads of areas of research in cosmology. And has implications for things like how old the universe is. So having two ways to measure it should let us confirm the number we get really well and hopefully calculate it to a high level of precision. The issue, as you might have guessed, is that that is not what happens. JWST has finally gotten involved in the whole affair and according to work in a new paper, it absolutely has not made things better at all. When we measure the expansion rate of the universe today, which we sometimes call the Hubble constant or H0, the two different methods give us two very different answers. We're now at a point where even the error bars on these measurements don't overlap on the two answers. So we say there's a high statistical significance to this discrepancy. The first method for working out H0 starts with the cosmic microwave background. From this, we can measure the expansion rate of the universe when that light was emitted really well. But we want to know the expansion rate today, and this light is from about 13 billion years ago. To estimate today's expansion rate, we start from the CMB value and simulate the universe evolving all the way up to the present day using the best model we have for the universe and all the physics in it. We call this the standard model of cosmology, or lambda CDM. It includes dark matter and dark energy, and when we work it all out, it predicts the current expansion rate to be 67.4 plus or minus 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, those weird units aren't important here, but the numbers are. The other method for calculating the current expansion rate is a much more local process, in the grand scheme of things, and it doesn't rely on us using a model to evolve things forward, potentially removing one source of errors. The issue is that it does rely on knowing the distances to certain objects very precisely, and those distances are really hard to measure well. For this, there are several distances that need to be worked out, which together form the cosmic distance ladder, but the most important ones for this story are distances to objects called Cepheid variable stars. These are incredibly bright, supergiant stars, hundreds of times more luminous than the sun. They're useful because they pulsate. They expand and contract in size over a period of a few weeks. And a really nice property of these stars is that the period of that pulsing is strongly related to how intrinsically bright the stars are. The longer that pulsing cycle takes, the more luminous those stars are when they're at their maximum brightness. This is super useful when trying to figure out how far away a star is. Otherwise, we'd always have the problem of working out is it very distant and intrinsically dim, or is it closer and intrinsically brighter? We say there's a degeneracy between the distance and apparent brightness. But for these stars, we can measure the period of the pulsing, and that tells us how bright the star intrinsically is. And therefore, it's much easier to work out how far away that star is by looking at how bright the star appears to be from our point of view here on Earth. That is, we know how bright it should be, we know how bright it looks when we look at it, and comparing those things tells us its distance pretty well. Admittedly, observing these Cepheid variables is just part of the process of calculating the Hubble constant in this way. There are many videos online that explain the process really nicely, and I'll leave a few of those in the description of this video for you. But here is a brief overview of the process from me. First, you need to use something called parallax, how much nearby stars move over the course of a year compared to distant background stars, to measure the distance to relatively nearby stars. Then you need to look for collections of stars that include some of those whose distance you know from parallax, and also contain some Cepheid variable stars. You measure the period of pulsation of the stars as we just discussed, and you compare the distance it gives you to that measured to the other stars with parallax. Hopefully, you should get the same answer. This allows you to calibrate that period luminosity relationship and ensure the Cepheids give reliable distances. Then you turn to looking for more Cepheids that are more distant, including those in other galaxies. 
You can then use those Cepheids to work out the distance to your new galaxies, happy that they'll be correct, as you've checked the method works with those parallax stars earlier. We then want to use another type of object with a standard brightness to go to even larger distances. The objects we use for this are called Type 1a supernovae. These are stars that explode when they reach a very specific mass, and this means they do so at a very consistent intrinsic brightness. Meaning, just like the Cepheids, we can use the brightness we see to tell us their distance. We first look for Type 1a supernovae in galaxies whose distance we know through the Cepheid work earlier to calibrate the supernova method. We can then apply the supernova distance measure to even more distant galaxies. We can't use Cepheids for the most distant galaxies because for these ones we often can't resolve individual stars at such large distances, but we can see supernovae. This finally gives us the distance to lots of galaxies that are far enough away to be affected by the expansion of the universe. We can then use a telescope with a spectrograph to take a spectrum of these galaxies to find the redshift of the galaxy, which tells us how fast that galaxy is moving away from us. We use this and the distance to that galaxy from the distance ladder, and the combination of how far galaxies are away from us and how fast they're moving away from us tells us the expansion rate of the universe today, exactly what we wanted. The problem is, when we use this method, we find the answer to be 73 plus or minus one kilometer per second per megaparsec. This is actually very different to the 67.4 plus or minus a half we got from the CMB method. And the error bars don't even overlap anymore, which means this is a real and concerning difference. I know the numbers might not sound too horribly different, but given the claimed uncertainties and the precision we want to nail this number down to, they really are worlds apart here. There are some possibilities for explaining it, but none of them have been confirmed yet. Maybe there's some error in the standard model of cosmology, so when we evolve the CMB value forward in time, we pick up an error. This is possible, but no such problem has been found yet, and it's hard to make changes to Lambda CDM and still have a model that explains everything else in the universe so well. The other possibility is some systematic or statistical error in all of the measurements we have to do for the more local measurement method, using the cosmic distance ladder. These could accumulate and propagate up the distance ladder, and there are a few possible sources of measurement error. That is where JWST is coming in here, trying to help us with its massive 6.5 meter mirror and sensitive infrared instruments. The Cepheid variable stars that are so important for the whole process are great, but they're also hard to find and measure. When we do find them, these stars are often very close to other stars, especially as we go to more distant galaxies, where it gets harder and harder to resolve individual stars. That means light from those other stars is often in the line of sight to the Cepheids, and it can leak into our telescopes when we try to measure the brightness of that one target star. This can make us think that the star, and hence the galaxy it's in, is closer to us because it looks brighter than it should in our telescope. It's been thought that this light leakage due to nearby stars and the lack of resolution in some telescopes could be a source for at least some of the discrepancy in the H0 measurements. If we think the galaxies are closer, that would reduce the expansion rate of the universe, and hence it could bring our value of 73 down closer to the other value of 67 that we measure from the CMB. The Hubble Space Telescope has done an amazing job finding Cepheids and calculating the expansion rate of the universe. It's one of the things it aimed to do when it launched, and it's done it better than we expected. But we still hope that the improvements that come with JWST might finally help us explain away the Hubble tension. This hasn't happened. Despite resolving the stars much better and giving us more accurate brightnesses for these stars, the results are basically the same. We've removed one possible source of noise in the measurements, and the tension is still there, strong as ever. That means the big picture is actually worse than it was before we started this. More interesting, perhaps, but we're no closer to understanding it at all. JWST basically just agreed with the Hubble measurements. It showed us that the Hubble ones were noisier, but the overall results haven't changed. This beautiful image of a galaxy is made from a combination of JWST and Hubble light, and here we can see a comparison of how the two telescopes see Cepheids. The JWST image is clearly better resolved, removing that potential brightness biasing, but if we look at the trend of the data, it's exactly the same. Same slope, less spread. 
The important thing is the slope of the line here is exactly the same with Hubble and with JWST. They've looked at 320 Cepheids in three galaxies, and if we compare the red JWST data with the Hubble grey data, we see that the JWST points have less scatter, but the line of best fit and the trend is still the same. What is interesting is it might tell us that new physics that we don't understand really is the cause for the Hubble tension. As we remove more and more sources of possible errors in the measurements, the local number of 73 plus or minus 1 it's harder to claim to be wrong, and so JWST might be telling us about something interesting going on in the universe and our best model, even if it won't yet tell us what that interesting thing is. It's too early to draw too many concrete conclusions yet, but things are looking interesting for sure. I'm not saying I want Lambda CDM to be wrong, but it sure would be exciting if it was, and there could also be some other error in the local measurement still, so it could even be both things that have a problem. Either way, the crisis in cosmology is still here for now. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts and questions on all of this in the comments below, so get involved down there, and thanks for watching. It took me a long time and many years of work at school and university to learn some of the physics concepts that we've talked about in this video. Now there's a much easier and quicker way to take tons of courses on these topics and many more, and that's with Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is my new favourite way to learn subjects like maths, physics, computer science and more interactively. The courses are all built around the concept of engaging a student, and as soon as the lessons introduce you to a new concept, they immediately get you to start applying that concept in a hands-on way. I find this the best way to learn and actually remember new ideas, and I'm sure you will enjoy it too. For example, their Intro to Probability course even includes a section on simulating driving the Mars rover, which I really enjoyed doing. If you want to learn to understand and explain the universe, then I cannot recommend Brilliant enough as a great place to start. Everything on Brilliant is available for free for a full 30 days if you visit brilliant.org forward slash Chris Patterson. Also available by clicking the link in the description of this video. And the first 200 of you to do so will also get 20% off if you sign up for Brilliant's annual premium subscription. And thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.